wow, it's great to see everybody here today. I looked out the window. I drove down here yesterday and prayed that things would go well for everyone who was coming. I was glad to see it wasn't as bad as I thought it might be. And I looked at the stagecoach property, and that looked like it's ready for the youth group tonight and everything else. I'm eternally grateful for that. But I prepared myself to only speak to just a few people because I didn't know who all would come. And I'm so grateful you made it. I don't want ever want anybody hurt, but I'm so grateful you made it. We are stronger together. We are more effective together. And in the world in which we live, getting a few drinks of God every time you can is a total blessing. And there's no doubt about that. Now, last week, if you were here, you know that I brought out my watch and told you it was broken. And everybody sort of got a little bit quiet and still broken. But I have an idea of what time it is. I'm not going to look now. I'll be finished as soon as God tells me to stop. Um, but I do want to say that it's, it's always better to... Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. Excuse me. Everything's good? Okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see you. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm so glad you're here today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll be talking more about what God has to say about what he wants in his church. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're our God. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you hold us in the palm of your hand. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are attentive to your people all the time. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are stronger than anyone or anything we ever face. Father, we pray, Lord, that today we would just put aside the things of the world for a while. We pray that we really try to understand the scriptures and apply the scriptures to our life. Father, we pray, Lord, that in a world where there's just so much turmoil, that we would have peace in the midst of a storm, that we would have love in the midst of an unloving world, that we would show the difference that Christ has made in our life so that more people would come to know you and so we could come to the fullness of Christ, Lord, and finish the race of life well. Father, it's not enough just to know you. We need to grow continually. We need to bring other people with us. We need to see what it's like to truly apply the Bible. We know, Lord, that your word has taught us, taste and see that the Lord is good. We know that your word has told us, Lord, that test me and try me and see if I'm not God. Father, we pray today, Lord, that we would give you that opportunity as we look at what you want, not just in your individual people, but what you want in your church, for this is your church. And we're thankful for that. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we began a verse-by-verse -verse journey through the book of Colossians. This letter, or epistle, if you will, can be read rather quickly. It's only four chapters that are in this particular book in the Bible. But living out its instructions takes making a lifelong commitment and genuine effort throughout your life. Is it worth it to take this journey? Well, absolutely. Colossians very specifically shares with us how to come to our fullness in Christ, not just as individuals, but also as a family of faith. Now, as we shared last week, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter when he was in prison in Rome during 60 AD. Well, there he heard that the church in Colossae had been greatly blessed, but was also facing some very significant challenges. The good news was the church was growing. That's always good news. It was being used of God to bring people to Jesus and change their lives in his name and through his power. The bad news was there was a false doctrine or false teaching that had started to wake its way into the church. And when it did, it started to call division and it started to call all kinds of difficulties. Specifically, specifically, there were people who were declaring that accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior was not sufficient to receive salvation. A person needed to obtain what you would call back in those days a very significant, a significant superior knowledge through human philosophy and secret traditions. In other words, receiving Jesus was not enough. Recognizing and receiving Jesus was insufficient. He was not able to do all that a person needed to do. This belief is not only still with us today, this belief is growing, and we all know that. So many people, if you talk to them, they'll say something like this, well, I'm not a Christian, but I'm very spiritual. 
So many people will say something like this. Well, one religion's just as good as another religion. So many people will say, if you talk to them, well, you know what? If you boil everything down, every religion teaches the exact same thing. Some people will say, just mix them all together, and after you mix all the religions together, here's what you need to do. Just pick out those things that you think are, are good for you and believe those things, and you're going to be okay. But what do we know as Christians? We know that Christianity is not a religion. It's not a religion at all. To be a Christian means to establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It means you recognize you're a sinner. You've asked him to come into your heart, forgive you of your sins, and you've made a decision, a decision that no one can make for you but yourself, to strive to follow him and his ways above all else. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means to be a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has blessed us in so many ways, but the way we always remember, with every single blessing we get from God, it comes with the responsibility from Him as well. After all, the scripture wasn't just written for us to change its message, it was written to change our lives. It was written to change us. Now, what does it mean to say that the scripture was written to change us? What does it look like, not just in individual Christians' lives, but what does it mean to have us changed in God's church? Well, last week when we were together, we looked at verses 1 and 2, and we saw that God wants his people to maintain a distinct and unique lifestyle. Will you hear that again? God wants his people to maintain to maintain a very distinct and unique lifestyle. What are you talking about, Pastor Ron? Well, let me be more specific. He wants us to speak differently than other people. He doesn't want certain words coming out of our mouth. He wants us to think differently. He doesn't want us to think some thoughts that we need to take captive, as the scripture says. He wants us to act differently when we're living our life and not be drawn by things that he doesn't want us to be drawn toward. He wants us to express attitudes that are differently. He wants us to have words and attitudes of life and light and love. What does he want of his followers? He wants them to be like Jesus Christ. Wow, that's, an that's a distinct that's a distinct characteristic that the Lord wants, is for his people to be very, very different. Well, today he's even going to go deeper, because he's not going to be just talking about the reputation some people talk about. He's going to be talking about character. Character. God wants his people and his church to not just have an outside reputation, God wants his people to have an inside character, which is godly as well. Let's see how Paul expounds on that particular truth. We're going to go a little ahead, and then we're going to come back. So let's go to Colossians chapter 1, and let's look at verses 9 through 12. I know we stopped at 2 last week. We'll be back at 3 in a moment. But let's see what he says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. Remember what we're talking about. We're talking about how he wants us to have a different character, a different inside, not just a reputation, a different character that goes with us. And he says in these, in these verses, verses, chapters 1, verses 9 through 12, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and been asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may have a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his or God's glorious might. Now, why does he want this? What's this all about? Look how the verses continue. So that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully be giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in his inheritance of the saints and the kingdom of light. Wow. That is a lot of power packed into this particular passage of Scripture. Did you notice that it's a very personal language that's in, this, in, this, in these verses? Six different times, what do we see? We see the word you. Three different times we see very powerfully that he's speaking very personally. History tells us that Paul never met the people who were in the church at Colossae, but he was confident that he could play a role in their life through prayer. You want to touch people? Pray. Right now we're praying for Carolyn. There's no doubt about that. Let's pray. Let's stop and pray right now for her. Father, we know Carolyn's not having the best day today. We pray, Lord, that you just put your arms around her. Father, we pray you just take care of her. Thank you for the many who are, who are looking after her now. We just pray, Lord, that you would touch her and just bring her strength. And we thank you, Lord, for her presence because she is such a special lady. But we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What did Paul say? 
He said he's praying for the church. What did Paul do? Did he just pray for the church and then move on? No, he prayed for the church and he continued to pray for the church. And what did he say he was praying for? We'll read the passage and you'll see what it says. He prayed that they would be filled. What does that mean? That means they'd be ruled, they'd be controlled with what? The knowledge of God. Now, why is that so important? Look how the verses continue. So they would experience spiritual wisdom and understanding. In other words, he says, I want you to know God's will, but don't stop there. Don't just know God's will. Apply God's will to your life. Now, what was the purpose that Paul was praying for these things? So they would walk, so they would live in a manner worthy of the Lord in a way that would please him. Paul was saying, in essence, every day and in every way, we as believers are to seek to bless the Lord. And how do we do that? Well, what does the passage tell us? We do that by bearing fruit or bringing people to Jesus and continuing to grow in our knowledge of God and inviting him to empower us so that we, through his strength, can have great endurance. Who doesn't need more endurance? Who doesn't need more power to keep on going when everything in you is starting to fade and you're just knowing that you're running out of your own human strength? What else does he want us to have? He wants us to have great patience. Who doesn't need more patience in their life? So many times we want things right away. And what else does he want us to have? Think about what these verses teach. He wants us to have great joy. That doesn't mean you're happy all the time. It means that you're standing and depending on God and that he will give you everything you need and you trust him more than you trust your emotions. So when we come together, we're not supposed to be an oddball group. We're not supposed to be weird when we come together. We're not supposed to be irrational when we come together. We're not called to come together and focus on ourselves. What are we called to be? Who are we called to be? We are called to be holy and faithful by living a life that demonstrates the highest level of integrity and the highest level of character. So it's not just something we do so we can be seen. It's something we do because it's a pressing desire of our life. Not long ago, I heard about a man who was a very well-known general. He served in a war. And after he served in a war, some of the representatives of an insurance company came up to him and they said, we want to give you a job. And you can make $50,000 a year if you take this job. That was an astronomical sum, especially back in the late 1800s when this offer was made. How did he respond? He said, gentlemen, there's no service I could offer you. They'll be worth $50,000 a year. There was a short pause. And after a short pause, the company's representatives replied to him, we believe you misunderstand what we're saying. We don't want you. We only want your name. Now listen very closely to how he responded. The general said, gentlemen, my name is not for sale. You hear those words again? My name is not for sale. May I ask you a personal question? What is your name? Have you asked Jesus into your heart? And have you put on the name of Christ? The name that the Bible tells us is above all names. In fact, the scripture tells us that at the name of Jesus, there is coming a day when every single knee will bow and every single person will confess that Jesus Christ is what? That Jesus Christ is the Lord. Have you noticed how different the name of Jesus is? Some people, when you hear the name of Jesus, they have joy. Some people, when they hear the name of Jesus, they feel threatened, or they don't ever want to hear it again. Some people use it in the most vulgar way possible. The name of Jesus is distinct, and he wants his people to be distinct. As followers of Christ, we are to mirror what he taught us. We are to think like him, we're to speak like him, and we are to act like him. If we're going to truly impact the world in which we live, the Lord must be in charge of every single aspect of our lives. He must have that priority, and for us to be effective, that has to be our inner desire, to be like Jesus, come what may. Now, the Apostle Peter, he talked about this truth as well, and it's important, so keep your finger over in Colossians, but go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And look with me at verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is another very personal passage. All of the Bible is personal. But you, let me encourage you to put your name there when you see the word you. But you, put your name there, are a chosen people. Wow, this doesn't stop there. A royal priesthood doesn't stop there either. A holy nation 
a people belonging to God. He's saying, you put your name there, you're a chosen people. You put your name there, you're a royal priesthood. You put your name there, you're a holy nation. You put your name there, you are a people belonging to God. That you may what? That you may declare the praises of him who has called you, you, not just other people, but you, out of darkness into his wonderful light. So what's the first trait God wants to see, not just in his people? Well, what's the first trait that he wants to see in his church? He wants us, he wants his followers to be distinct. He wants us to be different from those in the world. Not just in our lifestyles, but he wants it to be different in our character, who we truly are in the inmost being of our hearts. Well, what else does God want to see, not only in his people, but he wants to see in his church? He wants it to be a place where people really do love each other. He wants it to be a place where people really do love each other. That is such a vital trait and coin that we must never forget it. God wants it to be a church where everyone strives to truly love each other in Jesus' name. Now move back with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, where we left off last week, and let's see how Paul drives this home. He says, we always, notice he didn't say sometimes, notice he didn't say most of the time, he said we always, we always what? We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Now you read words like that, you say, well, why? Well, look how the verse continues. Because we heard of your faith in Christ. Boy, is faith important. But he didn't stop there. We heard of your faith in Christ and the love that you have for all the saints. Let's talk about some of the words that are in there because it's important to know what these words actually mean. The word translated faith comes from the word Greek word pistis, pistis. We're going to put that up on the board. And I want you to know that this kind of faith that the Bible is talking about in this particular passage does not refer to a faith being akin to a blind leap in the dark, but instead means believing something to the point that it really does change your life. Want to know if you really have faith? It really does change your life. You're going to be perfect? No. But you're definitely going to be different because this is the kind of faith that Christ offers. You see, understanding how important faith is is so important. But there's another thing we need to see in this passage that's, all, that's equally important and equally necessary. It's love. And what does he say about love? Love for all the saints. Love for all those people in the family of faith. You have often heard me say that in God's church, if everyone is not welcome, no one's truly welcomed, including God himself. And I believe that with all my heart. If love isn't expressed for all, guess what? We're not a loving church. That does not mean we agree on all issues. That does not mean that we agree on all perspectives. Please know it also does not mean that we do not as a church have convictions that we not only hold, but that hold, hold us and always will. Let me be clear. We at Heavenward Christian Fellowship fully take to heart what the Apostle Paul wrote to young Pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16. And 17, which tells us all scripture, not some scripture, not most scripture, but all scripture is what? Is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, why are these things so important? Well, look how the verses continue. So that the man or the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you see what Paul's saying to the church at Colossae? He says, You need to know what you believe. You really need to know what you believe. And you also need to have a love that turns into action. Faith and love are the foundational pillars of the Christian life. Therefore, as a church, it is our earnest hope and it's our earnest prayer that every time a person walks through the door, they will experience not just people who have a faith that is unshakable, but they will also experience love where everyone they see who looks at them will remember how much Jesus loves every single person in this world. Now, early in my ministry, there was a young woman when I first went to New Mexico in the first church where I served there, and she was a special person, there's no doubt about it. She came to Sunday school every single week. She went to morning worship every single week. Every evening when we had evening worship, she was there week in, year out, week out, year in, year out. 
and she always had a smile on her face. I don't ever remember looking at her for more than just a few seconds without seeing a smile come on her face. But let me tell you what else she had. She had some pretty significant mental challenges. That's as nicely as I can say it. She was a kind soul, there's no doubt about it. But she had significant mental challenges. I'm sure that many times when she sat in Sunday school, she didn't understand the lesson. I'm pretty sure that when she was listening to the sermon, at least on her own, unless God helped her, and I believe he did, she probably didn't understand the sermons a lot of times. When we would open the hymn books, remember the hymnals? Um, we don't hear too much about them, but she would grab the hymnal and she would open up, and sometimes she wouldn't be at the right page, and sometimes she wouldn't sing the right song. Yet week in and week out, I'll tell you what she did. She came to church, and when she came to church, she had a big smile on her face, and I'll tell you why. Because she knew Jesus loved her, and she loved him back. And because she found a place where she was loved as well. You want to really teach people about God? Love people. Love people like Jesus loved people. Church, do we really want to be who God has called us to be? Love people. Love people the way that, that Jesus did. She didn't come for the teaching. She didn't come for the preaching. She didn't come for the music. Why did this young girl come? Week after week, day after day, year after year. Because she loved Jesus and because she knew when she walked in the doors, she was going to be encountering people who loved her, who hugged her, who valued her. And you know what? Deep in your heart, you know what I know. That young woman's just like you and me. All of us long to be valued. All of us long to be encouraged. All of us long to be loved. As a Christian church, we are called to be more than friends. We are called to be family. God wants his church to be a place where people genuinely do love each other. They love each other in word. They love each other in deed. They love each other in attitude. And they love each other in desire. I love people. I think that's the one gift God's given me. I don't know. Singing is my thing. You don't hear me sing often when I did that one day. I think everybody's glad I stopped. I'm not saying preaching is my best thing, but I put my whole heart into it. But I do believe that God has given me a love for people. And let me tell you one of the reasons I think it's grown over the years is because every single day I ask the Lord to help me love people more than my own human desire. Because when you know people love you, you're more apt to hear what they have to say, and together you can grow in the Lord in an amazing way. This young woman was much younger than me. She passed away a few years ago, and when I heard about it, it stopped me in my tracks. And as I thought about it, I thought to myself, I never want to forget what I learned from her. And I hope that the Lord will help me remember her until the day I see her again up in heaven. Now, when I'm praying, when I'm working on the sermons, a lot of different things come through my mind, and I always have to ask God, is this just for me, or is this something I want to share with other people? And I was working on this particular message. I felt like the Spirit of the Lord said to me, that's a good example, but go a little deeper. Go a little deeper. Well, let me tell you about my last church in New Mexico. My last church in New Mexico was a man who went for years and years and years, and he was about 10 years um, older than I was. He had very significant um, challenges as well, mental challenges as well. He would do a lot of things that were very unpredictable. He would say a lot of things that you really sort of catch you off guard. But one thing for sure and for certain is he was a kind man. I never heard him say anything unkind about anybody, and there's no doubt about that. His words were kind. His words were, his attitude was kind. There was no doubt about that. But he would do some things that were a little different. Now, this was back before the days of cell phones. I had a home phone. I had an office phone, and sometimes my office phone would be completely filled up with messages just from him. I had a home phone. It was back when you had the tapes, and a lot of times when I would come home and I would listen to the tapes, my messages were just filled up from him. That was not the only thing that he did. I drove him home a lot of times. There's no doubt about that. We spent a ton of time together. But let me tell you what he did. Every single Sunday at 12 o'clock, because usually I went a little over. You probably aren't astonished by that. He would raise up his hand like this and look at his watch. And I watched this for a while, and then I decided maybe I needed to inquire why he did that. And I talked to him. He said to me, Pastor Ron, I just want to make sure we beat the Presbyterians to the restaurants. Now, let me tell you, back in those days, we had a lot of people who didn't get out. 
hardly at all. They didn't drive hardly at all. They went practically nowhere at all. And a big group of us would take a big group of people who didn't get out any day of the week. When they came to church, we would take them out to lunch, and then we'd drive them home. And I'm so grateful for that. There are a lot of things I remember about this man. But let me tell you two things that really stick out in my heart. He not only loved people, he really loved his dad. If you met him and you talked to him, he would talk over and over and over again about his dad. When his father died, let me tell you where he was. He was in an institution. He wasn't able to attend his father's service. Well, this happened long before I knew him. We heard him at church over and over again talk about how much he regretted the fact that his father had passed away years ago and he was never able to go to his service. So you probably know what we did, didn't you? Don't you? We had a service for his father one Sunday night, many years after his father passed away. I think it's fair and I think it's accurate to say that everybody was there was blessed by it, but I think he was especially blessed by it. In fact, let me tell you what this young man did. He became so touched that when he read the newspaper, I didn't know about this for a few days, every time he read an obituary, he tried to get in contact with the family and said, get Pastor Ron in Northville Church to do the funeral for you. That was a little tough. Let me show you with you something else about this man. A few years ago, I got a telephone call, and I was told he had gone to heaven. And my first thought, my first thought was this. I'm so glad that Northville Church was so good to him. I am so grateful we were so good for him. But then I pondered a little bit deeper. It's not enough just to go in with God. You've got to go all in. And as I went all in, the Lord reminded me in some very powerful ways how good he was for us. How good he was for us. He not only was a blessing, but he was a test of our genuine love. Do we always pass it? I hope so. I pray so. Because we need to have that kind of love one for another if we really want to be like Christ. Let me speak very straightly. Let me speak from the heart. Let me speak from God's word. All of us long to be valued. I have yet to meet the person who doesn't want to be valued. So we need to value other people. All of us want to be encouraged. Isn't that true? So we need to encourage other people. All of us hope that people will care about us and even love us. So we need to love others. We need to be more than acquaintances when we come into these doors. We need to be more than friends when we come to these doors. We need to remember we are a Christian church. We are to be a family. We are to be brothers and sisters in the Lord. God wants his church to be a place where people really do love each other in word, in deed, in attitude, and hear this, and in desire. And there's a third trait I see in this passage. It's found in verses 5 through 8 and then verses 13 and 14. After expressing how thankful he was for their faith and how thankful he was for his love, look what Paul says in verses 5 through 8. He says, the faith and love that springs from the hope, important word, from the hope that is stored up for you, see how personal it is, in heaven, and that you, see how personal it is, have already heard about this word of truth, the gospel that has come to who? The gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ and on our behalf, and who also told us of your love for the Spirit. Do you see the word you in there over and over and over again? This is a personal message. God wants us to take to heart. What's the third trait that God wants to see in his individual followers? What's the third trait that God wants to see in his church? He wants his people to find hope. Not just individually, but together. When I was a young man, there was a book that started this way. It was a Christian book. It said you can go so much time without food, so much time without air, so much time without all these things, but only about one second without hope. 
Now, why is hope so important? Why does he say six different times, you, 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 and then he emphasizes we need to have hope. Well, Colossians 1, 13 and 14 answers that question. Look at it with me. It says, for he has rescued who? Us, us, you and me, from the dominion of darkness and brought us, you and me, into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we, you and me, have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Wow. There is a lot in this passage. When I read a passage like this, it makes me pause. It makes me ponder. It makes me pray. And I invite the Lord to not only be something I'm reading, but something I want to read me when I live my life to speak to me. What are you saying, Pastor Ron? I'm saying this very clear, what the Bible teaches. God wants his church to be filled with hope. Don't we need more hope in this world? Absolutely. And why is this so important to God? Because he has won the eternal victory through Jesus Christ. He wants his church to be filled with hope because he's given us redemption. He's done something for us we could never do for ourselves. He wants his people to be filled with hope because he's given us forgiveness of sin and newness of life and a place in heaven with him for all eternity with our name on it. God wants his people to have hope because we have been rescued out of the dominion of darkness and been brought into the kingdom of his son. And where is the son's kingdom? Let me tell you where it is. It's in heaven. We don't nearly talk about heaven enough. Therefore, we're to strive to live on earth as we will live someday in heaven. When I'm tempted, I say to myself, would I say that if I was in heaven? Would I do that if I was in heaven? Would I think that if I was in heaven? So as a New Testament church, we have long-range goals and we have short-range goals. Our long-range goal is very simple. We want to go to heaven and be with Jesus. That's my biggest pressing desire. We want to see the clouds rolled back. That's what the scripture teaches. We want to hear the trumpet sound. Not to call me twice. We want to hear the shout of the archangel. We long to see our friends and family members who have gone on in the name of the Lord before us. We want to, we genuinely want to, live in a place that's sin-free, disease-free, tear-free, but more than anything else, what do we want to have happen? We want to be with Jesus. That's our long-range goal. But it's not our short-range goal. What's our short-range goal? It is to be conformed in the image of God's Spirit like Christ and to celebrate our salvation and the Lord's great gift of love and sacrifice with as many people taking them to heaven with us. Now, if we really want to take our family members, if we really want to take our friends, if we really want to take as many people with us as we say we do, then what does it require? Well, think about what we just finished seeing in this passage. We have to live a life that's distinctive. And we have to not only live, do the right thing, but we have to have it be motivated by the right thing by having a what a distinctive attitude. But we must not stop there. What do we need to do? We need to reach out and share the message of the gospel. What else do we need to do? We need to try, it, try to quiet down the spirit of fear, not just in ourselves, but the spirit of fear that's in so many people right now. And what else do we need to do? We need to allow the spirit of the Lord to shine in us and through us. The people who have encouraged me more than anyone else in the world have been people who have shown love for God, love for people, and encouraging me to try to become all I can be through the strength of Christ. So what does God want in his church? He wants it to be a place where people have a distinct or a very different lifestyle than the world. He wants it to be a place where there's a character that is very different from the world. He wants it to be a place where all people are loved and are valued. He wants it to be a place where people recognize and receive hope, hope that comes through Jesus Christ the Lord. That is what the Lord wants in Heavenward Christian Fellowship. That is what he wants in his church. He wants us to see changed lives, including our own. He wants us to not just say, I'll go this far, but not any further than that. He wants us to be people who are distinct in every one of these things and maintain that distinction, come what may. So let me ask you, where are you? 
as I ask myself that question too. How's my love life? How's my love life for God? If you really have a love life for God, you're going to talk to him. If you really have a love life with God, you're going to ask him questions before you make big decisions or small decisions. You're just going to share with him your day. When I do my prayer walks, I just say, Lord, it's good to walk with you again today. I'm really glad we can talk. And I do feel like after I finished speaking, that he speaks too. And sometimes he says to me, you've spoken enough. I've got a few things more to say to you. And I'll say amen to that. He wants us to have grace. He wants us to have peace. He wants us to have hope. Think with me. If these ingredients were in a cake, who wouldn't want to eat it? If these ingredients were in a life, who wouldn't be eternally thankful? I always think about the titles for a long, long time. I pray about the titles for a long, long time. Last week's title was, What Does God Want in His Church? I said, Lord, what do I do with this week's title? He said, well, you didn't finish last week, so use this one. What does God want in his church, part two? Hello. May we always be God's church. We represent Christ. May we give him our best. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we hear people in the world saying, Christians aren't loving people. Christians aren't kind. Christians don't have hope. They're always upset about something. Let me just say something to them that will, that will show everyone that they don't have as much peace as they say that they do. They don't have as much hope as they say that they do. They don't have as much love as they say that they do. Just turn off that Christian voice we'll, we'll hear people say because we don't want to hear it. And then we see some who are so dedicated to you that the light shines regardless of whatever comes against it. And it draws people's attention. And it shows people that there is a difference. That it's not a psychology. It's not a reputation. It's an inside act. For the Spirit of God has come into our life, not just to seal us to the day of salvation, but to change us. Lord, help us to want to be changed individually. Help us to use our spiritual gift. Help us to give you our time and our talent and our treasure. Help her give you, give you the best of ourselves. Father, may we decide that we want to finish strong. Father, may we run the lace of life, not up and down and in and out, but faithfully. You have been so faithful to us. Help us to be the people and the church you desire us to be, and help us to want that too. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.